Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be trying a little experiment. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to bring up ZFS on Linux, which doesn't sound like a big deal. I mean, we I've done that before. But this time, I'm going to use some th a device that requires Thunderbolt 3 in order to do it. Stay tuned right after this. We'll see how this goes. <music> So the, the device I'm going to be using today is a One World Computing or OWC Thunder Bay 4 Mini. I know that there has there's it doesn't seem to matter what kind of press, or what kind of manufacturer develops something you can always find something wrong with them or somebody that's having trouble with their devices. But it seems like OWC has gotten some bad press. Let me tell you my personal experience with OWC. The two drive enclosures that I have, and I have an older one back here that's sitting on the shelf back there that was in use on a Mac Pro. Uh, it is one of the cheese grater Macs. It ran for almost eight years until finally, I, I mean, the drives are still, they're over there in the in the uh, Gluster cluster and still running. So if you think they're they're, uh, they're bad, they're not. The, uh, the only thing that I've ever had a problem with with OWC is had a power switch go out on that machine. And so I, I wrote a letter to OWC, and do you think they would just send me a power switch? No. They sent me a whole new unit, and they had me send me the other one back. Uh, so <laughs> that just blew me away. I've, just, I've never seen that before. Usually they just send you a switch and just plug. It was just one to plug in. You screw it in, you plug it to the motherboard. wasn't a big deal, but they, I think maybe there was some changes that they had made, and so I guess they just felt, well, here, we'll just exchange it out with your old one, and that's what they did. So that's been my experience with them. Uh, they're a very good company to deal with. I've never had any issues with them at all. Uh, some of their higher-end stuff is a bit pricey, but... Uh, and I and I have heard some some stories about some of their devices, but I don't have any personal experience, and so I can't comment one way or the other. My experiences with them on the drive enclosures has been really positive and really good. So this one is a four bay. It, it uses 2.5 inch drives, and uh, we'll kind of look at it a little bit. <clears throat> so from the front, <clears throat> it's pretty nondescript. You'll notice that there is a there's a key slot here where you can lock this whole front cover over top of your drive bays. The drive bays themselves are not toolless, so you'll need a screwdriver to put your drives in. It comes with hard drive screws, so if you do intend to put uh, SSDs, you may not want to use the hard drive screws because the hard drive screws are just a little bit longer. And I'm not saying that you could damage the SSD, but it's possible they could touch because they are long enough where they might be able to touch the uh, motherboard. And it is possible they could hit an electrical substrate and cause a short. Not saying that they will, not saying that they won't, but why take the chance? They, they make SSD screws, so just go get those when you need to put those in. You'll need, um, well, I don't know, it's up to you, but you know it takes four screws per, so 16 total if you're going to use all four screws. Uh, I don't personally. I don't personally use that many, but uh, if if you do, then that's fine. I'm not telling you what to do. Uh, <clears throat> as far as the front has uh, four LED lights that indicate activity, and then <clears throat> this part lights up over here on the logo to indicate that there's power on. There is no power switch for these, as you'll see on the back. Uh, it just once you plug power in, they come up. Uh, there is two Thunderbolt connectors. This one, these would be used for one would be connected to your host and the other one would be a downstream daisy chain to another one of these devices or <clears throat> some under th other Thunderbolt device. The trick when you're daisy chaining Thunderbolt devices is if you have a Thunderbolt device with only one port on it, put it at the end of your chain <laughs> so that you don't have to worry about it. And the ones that have multiples, put those, of course, in the middle of the chain so that you can continue to chain off of them until you absorb your entire uh, bandwidth. So what I want to do is I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the models of, of this. And so, um, <coughs> so it, like I mentioned, it holds two, two, four 2.4 inch drives. Those could either be spinning rust or traditional rotational media. 
or SSDs. Now they have to be SATA. Some of the some of the OWC uh, enclosures handle either SATA or SSD, but this isn't one of those. So it has to be SATA SSD in order to work. Uh, there are two models of this device. If you have an older machine that has Thunderbolt 2, they have one that, that handles Thunderbolt 2 as well. Uh, although I think that's probably going to be rarer to find. The motherboard that I have in the Skylake is Asus, and they have one that is Thunderbolt 2. So uh, if I wanted to hook it up to the larger machine, I would need to do that or buy the adapter to go from uh, 3 to, to 2. But anyway, Thunderbolt 2 operates at 20 gigabits per second max. And so the speed on that is about 1346 megabytes per second. Thunderbolt 3 uh, is gonna operate on the on that drive, uh, that Thunder Bay at 1550 megabits per second. So 1556 megabytes per second. It can store up to 16 terabytes, of course, and that's based on available media. Yeah, there is a 16 terabyte SSD. I don't think it's SATA, though. I think it's SAS. <laughs> so, and you're going to work in this drive. Uh, and, and I don't know if I can afford it anyway. It's pretty expensive. Um, but the soft raid, it does come with soft raid software. Um, there are two versions, again, of, of, these, uh, uh, of these modules. So if you buy the Thunderbolt 3, you'll find two two uh, devices for that as well. One of them comes with Soft Raid Lite, and the other one comes with a full version of Soft Raid. Soft Raid provides JBOD, RAID 1, RAID 2, RAID 5, and RAID 1 plus 0. I'm not quite sure what the, the requirements are for Lite, but I'm pretty sure it's just RAID 1 and 2. So, yeah, uh, I should say RAID 1 and 0. I don't know why I have RAID 2 on here. RAID 2 isn't even in, pro uh, yeah, it's not even a thing. So <clears throat> it comes with a three-year warranty, and prices start at about $280. That doesn't include any media, so on top of that, you would have to include the prices for your drive. If you don't want SATA, there is a, a device that they make that is also Thunderbolt 3 that is NVMe. I could not get a hold of one of those. I, I mean, I purchased this with my own money. This isn't a, a sponsor review or anything. Um, so I could not get a hold of one. They're sold out everywhere that I've looked uh, for the NVMe drives, so they must work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I wasn't able to get a hold of this. <clears throat> so what, what the heck was I trying to accomplish here? I wanted to test out Linux and see how Thunderbolt 3 was supported. Um, well, why Thunderbolt? I mean, nobody's doing anything with Thunderbolt. You don't hardly see any YouTube videos from Linux people on Thunderbolt. Uh, you know, it's Apple stuff, right? It's, it's just proprietary Apple crap. No, <laughs> it's not. So, yes, Apple was involved with Intel to develop it. Intel held the patent on it. Uh, I, I don't know if Apple has some skin in the game there. They may, but... In 2019, Intel released Thunderbolt protocols as royalty-free, so they're no longer collecting uh, a tax to use Thunderbolt, and, and that was hopefully to get it more widely used. And the last 2019 and also this year, we've seen a lot more devices coming out with Thunderbolt 3 support on them. So, uh, And the, odd, the other thing is that Linux has had full Thunderbolt support for quite a number of years. So it's nothing new to Linux. It's been in there for a while. But, you, you, you know, you just don't see too many people talking about it. So I thought, well, okay, I'll give it a shot and see if I'm going to run into any kind of problems. I did see one YouTube video I thought was kind of interesting. The, the guy was was having all kinds of trouble with Thunderbolt. And I don't know what his motherboard was or, or, or what he was trying to accomplish with it. But generally, it's just plug it in and it works. You know, it's not... Uh, you may have to authorize the device, but it isn't it isn't rocket scientist. If you can plug it in and and go read a log to see, or have it pop up and tell you it needs to be authorized, it's not a big deal to do that. Authorize you just click yes and off <laughs> it's done. Um, but and I also wanted to use ZFS in place of their soft raid, so I got one that had the software raid light. Uh, device because all I wanted to do was try ZFS. I wasn't interested in trying out their software yet. Um, maybe I will be some down, where down the road, but uh, I prefer to use ZFS. It's what I like. It's what I know. It's what I'm comfortable with. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to plug into the Intel 10, 
uh, Intel NUC 10 because it has one Thunderbolt connector on it. There's a there's a Thunderbolt 2 on the other NUC, uh, but uh, I wanted to do it on this one. So uh, just to give it a try. Now there is Thunderbolt 4. Thunderbolt 4 is for Tiger Lake. It, it is not. It's not out for the for these chips that are on these machines, like the ten the the uh, tenth gen. They're still supporting uh, third gen Thunderbolt. So uh, there isn't any difference speed wise, but there's some differences, I guess, in the protocol. I don't know all the differences, but probably should study that out at some point and maybe come back and talk about it. But so the test setup is a NUC 10 i7 FNK. Uh, and that is a core i7 10710U, operates at 4.7 gigahertz, has 64 gig of non ECC DRAM. These are SODIMs, and that's the way I bought the machine when I got it. I didn't intend to run ZFS on it until some of these devices started coming out, and I thought, well, okay, I will give it a try. If I do put it in production, I'll go look for some ECC SODIMs. I prefer to use ECC memory with the ZFS. Uh, there's also a Samsung 970 Evo, a 500 gig uh, M2 NVMe. So yeah, uh, you know it, it's a it's it's a pretty good machine. It's uh, I I think it's an eight core, if I remember right. Yeah, I think it's an eight core. <clears throat> There's a slew of processors in it. I'll tell you that. Um, the Ubuntu uh, is the operating system I'm going to use is the Ubuntu Server 20.04.1 LTS. And the reason why I chose that is Ubuntu has been a, doing an awful lot of testing with uh, ZFS, particularly with booting the operating system from it. And, and you can choose that as an experimental operating system if you for your operating system if you want. Uh, but uh, I, I thought, well, okay. I mean, I know that Fedora is not doing a lot with ZFS right now. And I know that uh, Red Hat isn't, and neither is CentOS. Um, although both do have ZFS available for them, I just don't think they're trying to use it in this <laughs> this uh, vein. So uh, I decided to to try out ZFS Utils dash Linux, which is uh, ZFS for Linux, and that's version 0.83 that comes with Ubuntu standard repos. Now you can go out and you can download 8.4, but that's not yet part of the standard repo, so I would have to either go download it and install the dev, or I would just wait. And I think I'm just gonna wait and let Ubuntu test it and make sure that it's gonna work fine before I install it. I don't, I, for you know, I, I've got a variable here which is <laughs> running ZFS over Thunderbolt to begin with. I'm trying to limit the number of additional variables that could cause problems. And so I'll, I'm going to stick with the main line and do simple things just to see if the Thunderbolt part of this works. And then as I make sure that that works, then I start adding on other additional features. So it's crawl, make sure that it works and it's base config, then walk, add a few more features and test those, make sure it's fine and then run, which is then you put in the full set of features that you want for a performance for production use and really hammer it and really check it out and make sure that it's really gonna do its job. And you run it for a long time to see if there's any data loss or any problems with the data or any kind of corruption or bit rot that might be occurring. So yeah, that's typically how I do it. And I, I don't like to have a whole bunch of variables in the game because you don't know, first of all, you don't know what caused the problem. And then when you fix it, you don't know what, if it was three different things that were problems that you got a longer road to diagnose it and you're never quite sure is, did this fix actually, is this actually doing anything for me or is it still broke? So yeah, I, so I don't, I don't like to do that because it just takes a heck of a lot more time to diagnose things. So just keep it simple. Um, as far as the drives in the Thunder Bay, I'm gonna be using uh, four HGST. Those are Hitachi drives. Those are the Travel Star. These are the 7K 1000s. Now 7K means 7200 RPM, 1000 means one terabyte. And I already had these. I've been pulling them out of the Gluster cluster and uh, replacing those with SSDs. And the drives are still good. They still got some life in them. There's a few that are, that are approaching their end of life. They're reaching the age where things can go horribly wrong. <laughs> so uh, like, a, like a bearing being thrown or the head crashing or something. But 
<clears throat> right now they still have some life in them and might as well use them to do a little testing with it. Didn't cost me anything to put them in. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, also, there is a supplied cable that comes with the o OWC Thunder Bay. I didn't like to do that because um, I just, I, I have some Apple cables. I've had good luck with them. I have tried. I, now, I haven't, I don't know about OWC cables. They may be fine. I don't know. I haven't tried it. But I do know that I did get some cheaper cables a long time ago and tried those out. And the uh, connector split at the, at, at, at right at the uh, right at the Thunderbolt connection, these were Thunderbolt two. They split, and that's that's a fun that's a fun experience to grab a hold of a cable and do a hot plug with seventy five watts watts coursing through your fingers and up your arm. I mean, that it, uh, it's a little warm. Yeah, it's a little warm. So uh, I don't really want to do that again. Um, I would prefer not to do that again. So I like to use pretty good cables and. The apples last a pretty long time. I mean, I've got some of their cables that have been in service for eight years now. Seven, yeah, seven years now. So, yeah, <laughs> they work. They work. Goal of the test. So, really, I had just the, my goals are in stages here. I wanted to see if I get the drive enclosure to be recognized by Linux as a Thunderbolt device. Step one, right? <laughs> Did, does, will Linux accept it? Second, if I could get it recognized, can I get the drives up? Well, the drives create the device drivers and the devices in the dev table. If I can see the drives, can I get them configured? Can I go into uh, uh, a partitioning manager and put a file system down on them and then go format them? Once I get them configured, can I read and write data to them? Are they looking good? If they are, Next step would be to erase them and put a ZFS pool on top of them and see if it can mount it. And if it can mount it, then go ahead and create the volumes that I want to write and read to, and then put some date on it. And if that looks good, benchmark it. Then you put the hammer down and really try it and see what's going to happen. So test results. Normally on Thunderbolt devices, you, at least my experience with Ben, and this is brief, I don't have a lot of experience with Thunderbolt on Linux, I've got some, but some of the devices I've used have always required authorization. And authorization is more, is nothing more of, hey, I, <clears throat> I've got this device, it's Thunderbolt, do you want to authorize it and, and let, uh, let, uh, let it attach to the device tables inside of Linux, inside the kernel? Uh, and you use the bolt control, bolt CTL command for that. I'll show you that in a minute. I'm going to dive into the shell here and we'll go through some of this. And in there is a authorization command and there's also a list command and there's a bunch of other stuff you can do. So I went ahead and I, I plugged in the OWC Thunder Bay. I powered up the machine. I, I was real, real, uh, conservative I did not have I didn't hot plug it I don't attempt to do that on first thing first startup let's not let's not test every element of the driver <laughs> let's just see if it works first and Ubuntu recognized it immediately I didn't have to do anything not only did it recognize it it also knew it was a device controller and it also found the four drives and it created the device drivers in the dev table for me so I had SDA SDB SDC and SDD all good to go so Having all that out of the way, I knew the Thunderbolt part of it was working. So I didn't have to bother with the logs. Although I did check them just to see if there was any warnings or anything and didn't see any. So I went ahead and did an F-disk and prepared the drives with a partition. Uh, and then formatted them with ext3. Now I, I just did that just to see if I could read and write data to them to make sure that device, the device driver was seeing them okay. I could write to them, I could read data back and, you know... Just make sure that it was all good and good, and, and it was, it was fine. No, no errors, no problems mounting them or anything. So then the next step was obliterate the ext tables and put a Z, a Z pool on it. Uh, and so I elected, again, <laughs> keep things simple. Uh, it was to use a very generic configuration. I didn't try to turn on compression. I didn't turn on encryption. I didn't turn on the A shift 12. I didn't put on the normal types of, of things that you normally would do uh, in, in order to build up a production version of ZFS. I wanted to keep it simple. The more of those features you turn on, the more code gets called in to do things. 
and the more chance that you're going to hit something that hasn't been tested with Thunderbolt. So I didn't want to adventure too far out in the wings just yet. Let's get it working and make sure it's fine first uh, before we go experimenting out into the wastelands, into things, uh, into the unknown and potential issuing of problems. You don't want to try to hit the problem right away. You want to kind of sneak up on it. That's my approach. So um, I did create a RAID Z1, or a RAID, yeah, a RAID Z1 uh, on the four drives. And <clears throat> when I got back the, um, I did a, a Z pool status and a Z pool list. Z pool status showed the devices is okay, everything was good. Uh, the Z pool list showed me I had a raw format of 3.5 terabytes available. And of course, when you're talking of now, that doesn't take into account when you're using Z pools. That's just the amount of raw device that you have that you can write on. But when you put Z1 into the table, a portion of that available disk gets held back to be used for recovery. And so ZFS list is how you go find out how much data space you actually have. And it reports 2.6 terabytes. And that's the price you pay. If you want redundancy, you have to give up some of your disk for it. <laughs> so, and that was fine. So um, everything seemed okay there. I was able to create the, the volume and I was able to see the volume. And so I went ahead and created two additional ones under storage. So under my pool, I created documents and video as my first two volumes. But I thought, okay, I need some data to play with. So I could just brought over some of my video files and just played with them, but I thought, Let's put it to a test. Let's really throw some data at it. Let's, let's write to it for a while and see how it behaves. So rather than copy over just a few of my videos, I brought all of them over, all 192 gig. So eh, yeah, it took a while. It was coming over the network using R-Sync off the Gluster cluster, but hey, that's all right. I, I can go read a book and watch TV or whatever while it's doing that. It doesn't need me. So I don't know exactly how long it took. Uh, I'm guessing several hours <laughs> it took to do that, but uh, uh, I ran on it for several days, just like that. Didn't do anything else to it. I went in and I did some tests with the videos, brought them up, brought up some of the media and some of the things that I use for like some of the uh, slideshows and slide presentations and so forth. Looked at that. Those all look good. Uh, and so I thought, well, let's let's try it. Let's just put a benchmark on it. And so. I used IOZone 3, which is the one I used the last time I did a benchmark, I think, on the BSD system, and it was comparing it to Gluster at the time. Um, so yeah, I was using IOZone, and I wanted to see how it was gonna compare to my existing pool. So let me let me share with you some of those results. So this is uh, my existing system. This is the BSD ZFS. This is also a RAID 1Z. This has six drives in it, and they're eight terabyte each. Now, as far as bandwidth is concerned, it's really the, the number of platters and the number of heads that you have that determines the, the, the bandwidth. It isn't, the, the terabyte is just the maximum storage, but how fast it is able to deliver data and write data is dependent upon the number, sheer number of volume of heads. So it's just as simple as that. The, the more spindles you have, the more bandwidth you can get up to a point. There's a diminishing return when you have so many failures in your system that it just becomes nonsensical to continue to use it that way. But uh, that's a topic for another day. So uh, if you look at the initial write, this first column over here, uh, you'll notice that it goes anywhere from about 2.5. This is These are groups. These are simultaneous users doing the same operation. So they start with one, two, three, four, and five concurrent users operating. So at the maximum it gets up to is about, what, 9.5 maybe? Somewhere around in there at the five workloads, five, five concurrent users on the workload. Um, and if you look at, when we get to the next slide, you'll notice that it's about the same for um, the, the uh, 2.5 uh, on Thunderbolt. Uh, and of course this one, because it has six drives, it has a little bit more bandwidth, about a third more bandwidth than this other system with four. That's just mathematics, as simple as that. And so this one has a sweet spot, it looks like on four concurrent users with most of them. Now some of them are five, but You'll notice that for the most part, it starts to kind of drop off a little bit here at five. There's some of them that are dropping off sooner, like this one, like the read. 
I'm not sure why. Now, on this one, I know why that is. It's, it's out of memory. <laughs> this one is chewing up memory like crazy. So because of the uh, size of the pool, this one needs to have uh, probably another 16 gig of memory added to the system to really do this well. So I know what's going on here with that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the way that machine uh, performs. And then the... The, uh, the OWC, I'm sorry, these aren't, these aren't normalized. They should have had this at 30,000, but didn't think about it. So, uh, but you'll notice that about 9.5, it's about the same for four, and then it drops off at five on this one because it runs out of gas sooner because it doesn't have as many heads. So I, I'm getting about two-thirds the performance overall. I and mean, if I do a line-by-line -line comparison between these, and I did with the spreadsheet, not the graph, it's almost exactly two thirds the performance all the way across the board, and and guess what? Four <laughs> divided by six is two thirds as well. So the number it is it is related to the number of uh, drives strictly is the performance difference difference here. So I mean all in all, I mean it's doing pretty well. I mean I there's some there's some areas here now now I you probably noticed on oops. Let's go back and try that again. All right, so current slide hit the wrong key. Sorry about that. So you'll notice here that um, some of these are like the P read and the P write are missing, and I think that's because of the differences in the I/O zone. I probably just goofed it up. I I probably just got the wrong command, uh, and it, it it the I/O zone determines what test to run based on. Uh, the parameters you pass it so uh, it probably is a different command than the one i gave it so anyway those are values aren't here but all, all in all it's pretty solid it's pretty solid performance for what it's doing um yeah i can't i can't really complain much about it it's not bad sweet spot on bsd is four concurrent users sweet spot on linux is about three um, I think writes were a little bit f better on Linux with Thunderbolt 3, and that probably is just simply because of the differences in the controllers. Uh, the, the other one on BSD is about seven years old now. So it's not the latest technology, and it's certainly not the fastest <laughs> device that's out there anymore. But it does still work, and I'll continue to use it until it dies or until something cheap comes out to replace it with. But uh, I don't have any good reason to replace it with me just being here. I'm not putting it to real heavy use, so it's fine for my use. I also don't think that single uh, disk speed is a factor. Uh, now, there's some differences between 2.5 and 3.5 inch media. Obviously, the 3.5 is bigger. And so you do have longer distances that the head has to travel to traverse the full set of data on the disk. 2.5 doesn't have as far to run, so it can get over there pretty quick. Uh, but on the other hand, when the 3.5 is over top of a track and reading, there's a lot more surface area that it can read from, so it can gobble up more data if it's reading sequentially than the 2.5 is, and the 2.5 is going to have to move the head to get to the next track because there just isn't as much surface area there. Uh, <clears throat> as far as what technology they use to shrink down the bits that are on the spindle, it's about the same, unless you get into S shingled, and uh, we don't want shingled. We want CMR for ZFS. ZFS, don't put shingled drives under ZFS. You want a disaster, use shingled drives under ZFS. It does not like them. It hates them. So, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> it, it, it will not be happy. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to have a lesson in CMR versus uh, SMR, uh, <clears throat> there's a there's a couple of guys. I'll, I'll put some links below that talk about it all the time. I'm the wrong guy to ask. I'm you know hardware. I I am dangerous with. I, I can I can play with it. I understand it, but I'm basically dangerous with it. And they don't let me hold screwdrivers anymore. So. Um, but as you probably remember, from if you looked at the last video, what I was intending on doing here was to test CFS 2.0 release candidate. I tried that. I tried to get there. And I ran into some, er some problems with it that it prevented me to get to a stable build. And, I, you know, if, you, if you're not stable, you don't want to benchmark it because all you're doing is showing off how, f how fast you can crash it. So 
<clears throat> there's some bugs that, that in there that I ran into that were causing some problems. I'm not complaining about it. I mean, that's just where it is. It is a release candidate after all. It's a chance to kick the tires and find it. I did look at the, uh, you know, I did look at the list of bugs initially, but I don't get too excited until I have the problem, and then I go and look and find out what it is and what what's being done about it. So, I'm gonna let them fix it, and then I'll come back and I'll try it. Uh, <clears throat> so I do whatever any sane person to do. When you run, a, you, get, you run your face into a wall. You back up and you go pick up something that works. So I went back to 0.83, and I'll try the 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 2.0 release candidate in the future. So we're down the road. So um, just some final thoughts on this, and then we'll go take a look at, at the system and, and kind of play around with it a little bit. So when I purchased the free BSD system, now, okay, it's a 48 terabyte. It's going to be a lot more expensive, and, and it was a lot more expensive then because the drives were expensive. Eight terabyte drives now aren't anywhere near as expensive as they were uh, at the time that they were released, of course. Uh, I don't remember the exact cost, but, but the total cost was around 3200 just for the controller uh, the storage enclosure and the drives. So it was pretty expensive to set that up. Uh, the OWC Thunder Bay 4 Mini is about $280. The drives, if you can find the one terabyte HGSTs, now just be careful, there is a 56 RPM variant of that, which is new. Uh, I wouldn't suggest using that. There, you, would, you would not be, you would be looking at my graphs and going, wow, this is not even near what, what DJ was saying he's able to do. So yeah, don't bother with the 56. Those aren't really designed for ZFS. You want you want at least 7200 uh, uh, for ZFS if you're going to use rotational media. You want as fast as you can. Uh, but you'll you'll spend about 260 dollars for those. I think they're about 65 dollars a piece, something like that. Uh, there are some used refurbed ones. I wouldn't suggest that. You're probably going to get drives that are pretty close to their end of life. So. <laughs> I don't think you save your money. Don't do that. Uh, there are some new ones that are floating around still. I, there are probably new old inventory. I don't think the Travel Stars are being manufactured anymore, and I don't think SATA drives are being manufactured much anymore in the 2.5 media. You can find SAS, but unfortunately, this controller doesn't handle SAS. So, uh, and I think the reason for that is the manufacturers of laptops aren't putting rotational media in them anymore so the demand is probably falling and the manufacturers are probably just not going to make them anymore they're, they're putting their efforts towards ssds and nvme drives which is where the laptops are going so yeah i mean i would definitely probably lean more toward ssd long term for this and that's what i'm going to do i'm just using the rotational media because i had those but I will definitely, since I now know this works, I don't mind investing money in it, a little bit of money in it to get it up to snuff and actually getting it to a higher performance. I don't know if I mentioned this, but there is also a, a Thunder Bay that is for NVMe. So if you're interested in going that way with Thunderbolt, you can. Uh, it handles up to four NVMe drives inside of it over and then attaches to Thunderbolt. So uh, don't know anything about it, haven't reviewed it, and haven't looked at it. Uh, so. You might want to look on YouTube and see if anyone else has looked at it. I think it's called Thunder Bay Express uh, M.2 or 4M. Yeah, 4M2 is what it's called. Uh, and so, yeah, you might check that. So uh, SSDs, um, I've had pretty good luck with Crucial MX500. They're about, they're, for the terabyte, they're going for about 115 right now. I might probably pick up those. Uh, and save a few dollars. There, for fifteen dollars more, you can get a Samsung 860 EVO. Uh, I think there's also a BX 500 from Crucial. I don't know anything about those. I, I think they're TLC or maybe they're QLC. Uh, I'm just kind of worried about the longevity of that. I'm not scared of the drive, but uh, you know, QLC probably isn't going to last as long as TLC <laughs> drives will. But uh, yeah, you can, that's a different study for a different time. Also, there's the 870, and that is, I think, also a QLC drive from Samsung. I think it goes for around $119, somewhere around in there. Um, don't quote me. Go out and look. Uh, but uh, I'm just doing this from memory. So for the money, I think the OWC is a pretty good value. I mean, uh, uh, I can put 16 terabytes online for... Uh, of course, the drives are going to be expensive. Four terabyte SSDs are still running up, upwards of around eight hundred dollars. 
So I probably won't do will lose lose uh, leave of my senses quite that far, but I'll probably go one terabyte, maybe two. Uh, those are starting to become more reasonable, and I suspect next year will probably be even more reasonable. So, but I I think that's the way to go as far as the loudness of it. This noise you're hearing, if you're hearing it, that's a HyperDeck fan, and that is probably the world's loudest out of server room fan I've ever heard. Uh, as far as the Thunder Bay, 33 decibels is what I measured. So it's very quiet. Um, so no real complaints there. Obviously, I did, have not had time to test this on every single Thunderbolt 3 platform. There will be differences depending upon which motherboard manufacturer you have. You may run into issues with it. That's the that's the thing about that's the thing about choice. There's a lot of them. I mean, that's why I went with the Intel NUC. I mean, it's their chip, it's their hardware, it's 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 tested. They're, it's gonna work. Um, I don't. I mean, I would I wouldn't be afraid to use ASUS. I wouldn't be afraid to use Dell. Uh, I know Dell has one that uses Thunderbolt three in it as well. So, yeah, I wouldn't be afraid to use theirs. Um, uh, I wouldn't be afraid to use HP's either. I don't know, um, but I, again, I haven't tested those. I've only tested the Intel ones. I kind of stay, like I said, kind of stay with the mainstream just to make sure it works. So let, why don't we do this? Why don't we? Um, why don't we get? Let me get out of this. Uh, yeah, you can save that, I guess. All right. So as you can see, I've already been doing some stuff over here. So. Um, this is the machine that actually has it and it is plugged in so we can do bolt control is the command oops I guess it's not going to tell me unless I ask huh? for help all right so there's my commands and I have authorized config domains and role forget info so list monitor power so let's just do Uh, let's do list and then a help and, and I guess H that I need. Yeah. So it's just saying all I need is a minus A. All right. Let's give it a minus A. So I have a green light. Uh, it obviously is fat, dumb, and happy. It, it has found the host controller and it also has found a device. Uh, there's a there's a UUID for it and it's authorized and it is running and it's owned by Intel, which is, of course, the device itself. So if I let's see, I think I think bolt control info needs a device ID. Mm, yes, it needs a device ID. I think there is a way. Uh, let's see. Listen and print changes power config. So if you if you end up in a situation where you have to authorize the device that's right there, uh, the config allows this. This is a setter and getter. I can show you. Let's see. Describe. Okay. So these are all of the these are all the parameters that you can either get the device information or set the device information that you want. Uh, so you can see the the domain. This is global. Uh, the protocol, you'd have to read about it a little bit, uh, but it's basically a layered protocol where you have domains of devices and then the devices themselves that are tied together. And uh, that allows the controller to group the IMMUs together. So if you want to do things like pass through or you want to keep devices together, you can do that. I don't know if I can try it. I just, the, the, the documentation isn't real clear on some of this, but let me just try, let's see, global, let's try, let's try uh, info, no, version. Let's try version, see what we get, version one. Um, and I don't know what I have to do to get down through these. Bolt Control and I are new. <laughs> so, uh, but I can tell you it is here. I can do an LS block. Um, maybe if I spell it right though, huh? So if I do an LS block, I see the devices have already been built. 
And then I've already actually mounted them and actually created a ZFS pool with them. So I didn't have to do any of this to get these to appear in the list. That happened automatically and Ubuntu took care of that for me. So I, I basically could start with partitioning and doing my, my thing with it. So ZPool status, um, this is what I created. Uh, and this was created a couple days ago, as you can see on Wednesday the 30th. Uh, this is the storage. Uh, this is the name of the ZFS pool, and this is the type. So this is a RAID Z1, and then these are the devices, and they are all online. But that doesn't really tell me much, and I did do a scrub on it just to make sure. I did a whole bunch of writes, and then I decided to do a scrub just to see if it was okay. Uh, ZPool, and it was, obviously, and I did a ZPool list. And this will tell you what your... Uh, sizes. So 2.62 terabytes is the size, and of course, uh, there's some allocated from that. So 3.36 terabytes is left. But this doesn't look at the Z RAID. It doesn't, and for that, you need to do, if you really want to find out the truth, this is what you actually have is 2.36 terabytes uh, usable of space. And then these are, I mean, this is your pool. It's going to call it a volume on this side, which is fine. Uh, and then these are also these are volumes that are mounted under storage. So they inherit whatever parameters and options are configured into storage unless you override them. So this is my video pool library, 191 gig. Uh, and then, yeah, YouTube is under there. And then all the stuff that's there. So um, let's go, let me see where am I at here. Let's go to, let's go there. And I think I might have, a, let me remove that so we don't have that tainting our results. So I have, I have to do a shell because I didn't make it executable. So let's do home pi. Let's just try a couple of things. Let's try, uh, this is a sequential read using file, which is another benchmarking tool that I use for Gluster. And the reason why I do is because you can really create some large files with it, which Gluster likes. And so, wow, 7,211 7, MIBI bytes per second on the read. Now, granted, Granted, CFS likes the cache reads. It'll stick it into memory. So let's see, let's see how much memory it's actually chewing up. This has been running for a few days now. So 16.7 gig with this much storage. That's that's about right. Uh, that is about right. So yeah, that's about right. So it does use it does use memory. Now the only way you can trim that down is if you get some of your logs off and and some of your your advanced caching off too. So yeah, um, obviously I'm not going to be able to do much with this machine. It just doesn't have the ability to plug in additional SSDs unless I chain them onto the Thunderbolt. So I could probably do that, I guess. Let's try a write and see how that goes. <clears throat> this will not be caching although it did pretty well. So uh, IOPS 2,381, minimum, maximum 2,680, and then average 20, about 2,500. Let's see what the other one was. Uh, 3,646, average 3,711 30, 3, on the read. Writes 4,032 maybe bytes per second. That's, that's pretty square. I mean, that's, that's that ain't bad. <laughs> that's not bad at all. Um, I could test 4K, but I can tell you that 4K does is not really fast. And you've probably seen that same result under under any other operating system too. It's not stellar. Um, I could I could try some bigger block ones, but I really use those for um, for uh, Gluster because Gluster likes large block files. So uh, as far as the benchmark results, um, the command that I use to do that. Is is basically uh, it it does a minus capital R I three which is the um, I think that's the I have to go look I don't remember users five 
read as 512K reads 256 megabytes. This is what it's going to try to push out. It's going to build an XLS, and then these are the files. And then it does a DD afterwards just to, just to test how fast it can actually do that as well. So uh, I didn't measure that. I didn't save the measurement for it. I was more interested in the repetition as it goes through. If you, uh, if you want to see this run, and we'll kind of let it run through a little bit. But it'll, it'll actually go through each of the children. So now it's doing initial writers, then readers read readers and so it'll do a min max and average for the process and then it'll just keep doing that and then it'll, and once it completes all these tests it'll bump to the second worker and then it'll comp restart the test at the initial write and start over again and that is yeah it's actually working away over there so yeah you can just watch this in real time and yeah that is in KB and that is flaming fast yeah that's pretty quick <laughs> No complaints there with rotational drives. So um, that's basically all I had today. Um, let me uh, let me switch back over here. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below. If, um, if there's something you'd like to see me test with this, uh, I have a whole range of things that I want to do still. I want to destroy this pool, and then I'll start to build up a production pool that has compression and has encryption on it. Uh, at, at least with the amount of drive space that I have here to work with. But, hey, it's, it'll be fine to play with for a toy. It's fine. 2.6 terabytes is plenty of disks to play around with, so at least for my needs. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll get back to you. But if there's something that you are interested in knowing more about, let me know. Let me know in the comments below. I'll be happy to take a look at it for you. Uh, as always, I hope you enjoyed this little talk today. I hope you. I, I wish I could have gotten to the, the, the release candidate 2.0, but unfortunately... Uh, I, I just couldn't get it stable, so I move on. I <laughs> will wait and we'll let the guys work on it. Uh, speaking of that, I, I did want to have I did want to end with a, a kind of a comment on the uh, the unfortunate thing that's going on with Nvidia and the 3080. I don't you know I, calm down guys when when there's a problem with hardware, it's usually a driver. I mean, <laughs> um, if if the uh, if the hardware was so far off the mark, there would be some serious redesign that would have to be done, and so they check those pretty thir thoroughly before they go out. The uh, as you probably remember, the issue was stability, uh, and these cards are running pretty close to the ragged edge uh, anyway, as I understand it. I mean, there isn't a whole lot of headroom there, but it looks like you can gain some from it if you start to overclock them up and. Instability is kind of normal when you're overclocking things, isn't it? I mean, is that kind of what you expect? But uh, in this case, there was a lot of different theories and, and just conjecture. And uh, don't fall into that trap. Let the engineers work the problem. I mean, geez. Uh, unless, unless you're one of them and, you want to, and you're working for NVIDIA, but you probably wouldn't be talking about it in a public forum anyway. And... And uh, the problem you're, you're actually you're actually causing more harm than you are good, because where Nvidia is at today and every other vendor is that they cannot move their date because of a slip. And so, ready or not, here it comes, and, and that's our fault. I mean, I blame us as the consumers because we are applying a lot of pressure to these companies to get it out, get it out. We want it. Get it out right now. And I don't think that's such a good idea. You should, I mean, I mean, let the cake bake. And when the cake is baked, take it out of the oven and eat it. But you want to have it raw in the middle, go ahead. I mean, but I, I would prefer to just kind of let it bake. I, you know, I... I guess that I guess things have changed since I was a developer in large large program uh, projects. But you know, if it wasn't ready, it didn't get released. We would delay, and you can't do that today. Uh, people will just go crazy. They go nuts. Um, don't be like that. I mean, I, let them let it bake. the uh, The problem that you have here is that when you get a, a release date. That's chosen generally by marketing. Engineering doesn't have a choice about that. In fact, mar I mean, I've been in those discussions. Marketing will not move. 
There's usually competitive pressure. There's competitive reasons to release on that date, or it might be because it's a trade show and that has the greatest number of people watching for it. And, and so there are good reasons why they choose those dates and they will not budge. The problem comes is when marketing also picks the start date. And if they do that, then they're really putting engineering at risk and they're putting themselves at risk too. Now, I don't know if, if NVIDIA is practicing those kinds of things, but I do know that we as consumers should back the pressure off a little bit and let them have some room to breathe and some room to work the problem. NVIDIA got it fixed. So I know, and now people are saying even that has a problem, but uh, <laughs> you know, if you're unstable, what do you do when you're overclocking your machine and your machine's over, over it, you push it a little too far, what do you do? Do you complain about it or do you back it off some? I, and I don't think they've backed it off a lot. I don't think they've backed it off to enough to make any difference, at least from the benchmarks I've seen. It, it seems fine. I'm not defending NVIDIA. I'm not defending anybody. I'm just asking us to please let the engineers have their day. Let them work the problem. Uh, it would be better if they could do this under the development time frame and they have the time to work with AIBs and they have time to work internally with the engineers to get through all of the issues so that you're not the tester. You don't want to be the tester. Uh, let those guys be the tester. And I wish we could get back to a society where we were more patient about waiting for things. Do you really have to wait? Do you really have to have it uh, this this particular card right now? The longer you wait, the better product you get. And I, I don't know I don't know when the ABIBs got their drivers. I've heard all kinds of things, but um, you're also shortening it up so much that even even it's hurting them. So yeah, this is not good for us. We don't want that. Um, Anyway, that's all the thing I had to say about it. So I hope you enjoyed this video today. And uh, as always, if, if, if you want to thumbs down what I said, great, that's fine. You don't agree with me, but, you know, engineering is what it is. This is not something you can take a cookbook and just build. It isn't, oh, I have a graphics card. I just do A, B, and C, and D. It takes me eight weeks and I'm done. No, they're pushing the envelope. They're developing new technologies. They're adding new pieces to the hardware. They're expanding it. They're making it faster. Nobody has a blueprint for that. It's in ground that isn't been walked on yet. So you you don't have a blueprint. You're, you're get, I mean, the best you can do is guess how long things are going to take. And if you run into issues with timing and problems, then you work them. And you take time off the schedule to do that. So, I mean, I've been there. I understand it. I know how that works. So... Be patient, let them work it, They're, they'll get there, it'll be fine. And uh, I hope maybe uh, maybe our, our pressure from us will back off a little bit. It, the world won't end because you don't get your graphics card on a week early. Uh, I promise you that, it won't end. So, hope to see you all again real soon, bye for now.